Welcome to a new episode in the Making the Magician's Daughter movie podcast. In the series specials called The Whitman House. These first two and a half months that I've been in the US now for the trip to make the Magician's Daughter movie have mainly been focused on finding places where I could sleep and where I could work on the development of the project. I went all over the West Coast and especially in the beginning I did not always know where I could sleep the next day or even the week after. Luckily by now I have found places where I can stay until the beginning of November. So now I can focus on writing. The houses where I could stay were mainly houses of friends and the spaces varied from guest rooms to taking care of a whole house and one cat, like the one I am now in Northern California. The most challenging place was the Wheatman house, but it was also the one with the most history and worth to do a whole episode on. Lena Wheatman and I, we talked about the challenges of the house but also about our childhood, as we both had fathers that dominated our childhood with both their passions. We recorded this episode on the last day that I was there in Pasadena, and both Lena and I were tired from the heat that week, so we could not always find the right words, so bear with us. This is the nature of podcasting in the wild. Alongside the audio podcast and the YouTube version, you will find bloopers, and small featurettes that highlight some of the topics we discuss. So watch them all. And if you are inspired by David Wheatman's art, you can buy his art at their website, wheatmansart.com. Enjoy the episode. Today's episode is one for the specials. Welcome to a new episode at Making the Magician's Daughter Movie. Um, And we call this episode lovingly, you will find out, um, the Wheatman House, where I stayed two weeks during my Holly trip to make this Hollywood trip to make the Magician's Daughter movie. <laughs> this house was designed and built by the late animation and silk screen artist David Wheatman, who is known for his mid century modern works, including posters, prints, and ceramics. Wheatman began his career in animation as a background artist during the 1950s and 1960s. During his later life, Wheatman's silk screens were featured um, in the sets of the television series Mad Men, which revived interest in his work. In 2010, the LA Times referred to Wheatman as possibly the most famous unknown artist. David Wheatman died at his home in the Highland Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, where we are now on August 6, 2014, at the age of 93. I had the honor to be able to stay in this house as I'm doing this Hollywood trip to make my movie with almost no money. Today, I am talking to his daughter, Lena Wheatman. In this house that was designed and built by her dad and which she is renovating together with her brothers, Troy and Josh. Welcome, Lena. Thank you. I think you need to be a little closer to the mic. Are you the director here or am I? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I guess we'll find out. Uh, Let's talk about the house a little. Okay. Um, This is the home of their marriage. They, They never, I think they maybe rented an apartment for a couple months, but basically my dad bought this piece of land at an auction and I think he got it for a thousand bucks or something like that. And that's an unheard of amount of money right now, but that was in 50, 1951 or something like that. And yeah, we grew up here. I mean, the, the house was built up around us, you know, from, ugh, I started in the early 50s, I don't know. And I was born in 1957. So somewhere between about 1953 and 1957, they got it to the point where they could have a kid. I would characterize it as what they have come to call mid-century. It's a post and beam design. And the reason why my dad designed, so he was very influenced by Japanese design. And uh, you can see that in the design, but also the way the, the garden surrounds the openings, you know, the, the large glass windows, and then they look out onto natural light and the gardens. 
and the patios and so forth. Um, but also, he was not an architect or a builder by training. And so he had to make the simplest structure. I lived only two weeks in his house, and um, uh, it reminded me a lot of my dad, because my father never designed and built a whole house, but he always, always was doing the interiors and building uh -huh. new rooms. And oh. so I don't know, he was also always, I just remember the sawdust and, okay. and I could see how they both has had this um, sense of detail. Um, so just the bathroom here, I love how that cubby uh, holds toilet paper and your father was advanced in his design because huh. it's perfect to put your iPhone there and <laughs> that was the time there were no <laughs> cell phones yeah, so why yeah. do you want to preserve it? It is a beautiful space um, it has all these glass walls that let in all this light and it looks out onto the patios with the greenery and it has these high ceilings, so it gives you a feeling of, of a big space and, and a big open space, you know. And the high ceilings are throughout the house. I think the only place that doesn't have them is that one hallway down there. And so it, it feels like you can breathe, you know, when you're in here because it's a big open space. Also, there's lots of natural wood. He, he was, you know, he had very limited resources, so he bought salvaged materials all the time. Even that pecky cedar that's in the, that everybody loves that's in the living room was something he got on special. But he made it work. It's like he built the house around the pieces he found. I think those doors, those giant doors with the steel frames, I mean, the, the doors are almost 20 feet wide. I think they're Belgian, I don't know, but he found those in some kind of salvage yard. So he designed the house around these pieces. There's no way he could have had them built. You know, like nowadays you order custom built windows, right? Cost a fortune. He, he couldn't do that. You know, so that, that's part of it. There's so much beautiful natural wood. There's mahogany and redwood throughout. And like that little cubby hole you're talking about in the bathroom where the toilet paper goes. And there's actually a place for magazines to go in there. So you just sit and read your magazine on the toilet. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's a new, that'll be for later. <laughs> I'll have to come back for that. They have to come back for that. So we're, we're preserving it because we think it's a beautiful home. It's beautifully laid out and beautifully designed. Now, you had a little different experience. Yes, yes. I, um, yeah. Again, you're directing because we're going to the next queue. That's okay. I thank you. Uh, yeah. It's been uh, quite a challenge because you stripped it down to build it up again uh, at some point. Um, and um, I was struggling with the antique stove. We'll do a little uh, video of that later. Uh, <laughs> how to. It feels like you're in the woods making a fire. And as I am a city girl, I've never made fire in the woods. <laughs> anyway, um, there was a little fly challenge. So um, I killed some. I released some. At some point, I think it was the Lord of the Flies that I think I conquered at some point. I will make a picture of the dead cousins uh, that is probably still lying somewhere. Anyway, so... Um, These were no ordinary flies. Right. You called them superfly. Yes. But they were huge. I've never seen flies like that. Well, you're now saying it's my fault? They, no, they, no, no. No, yeah. I just, I don't know where <laughs> they came from. No, obviously the heat came and all these things hatched. And, right. the, and they were just one of the things that hatched. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, let's talk about your dad. He worked as a background uh, artist and a painter at uh, UPA. He's credited with helping UPA develop the distinctive modern style, which became a hallmark of the animation studios. Um, I didn't know that. See, there you go. Wikipedia, right. whoever okay. wrote it. All right. Um, and he has credits of on TV series and special specials on the famous adventures of Mr. Magoo and Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, 1962. I might even have seen it as a child 
at the neighbors once the neighbors had TV. Ah, uh, you know that I'm told was the first feature length animation uh, film, or, or the first feature length animation film to be televised. One of the two of those. It might be just to be televised, but that was a early innovative thing that they did with Mr. Magoo. Yeah, I also heard uh, or read that he, you know, worked on shorts uh, for Popeye, which I loved, and yeah. I know that came to Dutch TV at some point. And you know, the uh, one of the things, and maybe it's, uh, you know, one of the reasons why Hollywood is magical to me is that I always, every time I meet somebody that either has worked in the industry as a child or uh, worked in the industry on things that I know, uh, it mm -hmm. just feels magical to me because, mm -hmm. it, you know, you live in this dream world as a child when you watch these TV series mm -hmm. and now it becomes so close. And um, I think they always say there's no history in the United States, but I feel history in Hollywood. Uh, and that's probably because of my love of, uh, of film. Mm. So were you aware as a child? Well, 1962, so then you were only like five or something, but were you aware that your father was working in the entertainment industry? I didn't think of it as entertainment. I thought of it as animation. I don't know how old I was when I figured it out, but you know, he brought work home all the time and I still have downstairs the um, the kind of table, it's a metal table that the pieces, you know, they use special kind of cells, uh, acetate, it's the clear plastic, to work on that has certain holes so everything lined up in the frame correctly. And I have a number of the tools still downstairs. And he would bring the little cans of paint home and the and he would work, sit and work. It's seasonal work, you know, it would be really, really busy. So yeah, he he brought work home all the time. I just knew he was working, and you know, then he'd work when he was on a show, or it was in season. You know, it was the season when they were creating. He would be working long hours, so he'd be gone a lot. And so I was aware that he was working on cartoons and animation. That's all I knew, but I I didn't even know what shows except for a UPA I think I knew about fractured fairy tales and and Bullwinkle and Rocky you know hearing Lena talk about her dad working at home brought me back to my childhood where my life and my world was also filled and colored by the sets of my dad's passion of magic he built and painted props for his own magic acts and those of my brothers and he built these huge Disney characters for instance for his performances for kids because they knew those and nobody talked about copyright in those days by the way but back to lena's dad it looked uh, what i read is that he left animation uh because he didn't uh like or became frustrated with group centered uh animation process and that when i read that reminded me again of my dad and i think um, people like that don't do always do well with collaboration. And my dad, he mm -hmm. always worked with his best friend, Ko Fuhrman. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ko Fuhrman was really good in collaborating in, in big groups on magic inventions and so forth. But my father didn't uh, seem to be able to do that a lot. So it, it again reminded me of my own dad. Hmm. Um, so um, those kind of things sort of make an impact of how their life changed and then, of course, our life changes with, you know, with those things that they are doing. So yes. tell me tell me a little bit about your dad and his character. And do I describe it correctly? That he's a little bit of a, a lone wolf artist. He's a, he was an artist, first and foremost, artist, period, you know. I think he probably had some frustration because he wanted to have more control over images and design and overall. I mean, he did different kinds of jobs in the animation industry, mostly painted backgrounds, but you have to understand that when you paint backgrounds, there's a lot to it. And there's also, there were jobs called color keying. Do you know about color keying? Where you determine 
the color scheme of the characters and of the backgrounds, everything has so that the characters and their props have to stand out from the background in such a way, but yet, you know, it has to be harmonious. I mean, it's very, it can be very complex. And um, the other thing was when they designed back then, they had to design so it worked in color and black and white. They couldn't just design for color because lots of people, even us, we just had a black and white set. Right. So it had you had to understand value and color, and it was very complex for some for some shows. It it was it varied. You know, as um, a collaborator, because at some point he chose to do his own sales screening mostly. If Wikipedia says he was frustrated with, say, the studio system in working together maybe he decided at some point i want to do it my way and so i'm gonna focus on silk screening now was that something that you that decision is a big decision so i don't know all of his choices what i do know is my mother's the one that suggested silk screening and he and my mom collaborated on a lot of pieces or not necessarily collaboration so but he you know my mom was always doing images was always drawing was always doodling was always painting and he might see something she was working on and he'd say okay that's that's great let's let's turn that let me turn that it's like she created a layout and an image and then he turned it into he orchestrated it like an arranger it's so funny, you know, because this reminds me of uh, an interview that I did in the early days of The Magician's Daughter when it was still called uh, Disappearing Act. And I interviewed my father's best friend. Hmm. And so this is exactly how the collaboration huh. and the relationship between huh. them was. Oh. So Ko would come up with him. And I have even a scene, it's a Dutch word again, I can't. Uh, but it's exactly how you say it. My dad would then take that idea mm -hmm. and then completely made, a f made it fitting that it worked. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a great, uh, that's a great collaboration. And, and I've never heard you tell that about your, you know, your mom and your dad's relationship that it was like that. So yeah, this house, man, it was a challenge. It was like the house was rejecting me all the time, but yeah, it was the stove, which we will show. But um, also the lizard that got into the house. But the most crazy thing was, and of course we don't have that in Holland, is the dancing animals on the roofs. <laughs> oh, I forgot about those. You forgot about those. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it was like, I'm sh I thought they were bobcats or whatever, uh, or coyotes, but you said they cannot be on the house. But yeah, I just I didn't sleep well because... Uh, at some point, the um, the animals outside were, you know, there were animals inside that were smaller but still scary. <laughs> and then there were animals outside that um, coyotes howling. Uh, really, the first time on the roof, I thought it was a person. Mm. Um, and it could have been very big raccoons or I don't know. But it, it was scary. And then, of course, mm. the light goes on in the greenery outside, but you don't see anything. And anyway, so but uh, you thought it was funny, all these uh, uh, things. Or I'd say, I just want to say for the record that I, I was very grateful. Sometimes I think looking back on it, you held off in the beginning a little bit, probably because you weren't sure uh what time you were renovating or builders would come in or whatever and sometimes i thought you must have been clairvoyant and knowing that this city girl would have a problem with this house you know i actually didn't anticipate that and i felt bad once you started it was just one thing after another every day i get a new text and it was like today it's superfly there's a lizard in the house there were dancing animals they were really big on the roof, dancing on my head. <laughs> so I, I didn't think about that. I mean, first of all, I grew up here and I'm used to the wildlife, I guess. I didn't ever think about it. I'm used to the stove. I mean, my mom cooked on that stove her whole life and we have other people and it's, I know if you're not used to the stove, it does take a certain amount of patience. That's, 
the bottom line with that. But I did feel bad for you because I thought, oh my God, I thought this was such a good place to stay. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be misery for you. And then of course it got hot and, it, and it's hard to cool down the whole place because we've lost electrical on that wall, which had that really good new air conditioner, but there's no way to plug it in over there. <sighs> And with that sigh, I said goodbye to the Wheatman house, and I thanked the Wheatman family for letting me stay there. I will never forget it. And now, please go to the YouTube site of our video podcasts, Making the Magician's Daughter Movie, where you can see some video footage of the challenges of the house, such as the ghost stove that kept playing with me until the end, and the image of the superflies you would want to see some of the Wheatman art or watch the short blooper, which is eh, funny. So watch the clips on the YouTube site. Enjoy, have fun and stay tuned. Thank you for listening. <laughs>